Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our R and Shiny best practices discussion. This is going to be a relatively quick conceptual video before we dive into some actual Shiny code in our next video. So if you recall in our last basic R best practices video, we discussed how to make code that is descriptive, consistent, concise, human readable, and accessible. We're going to extend all of those ideas into this video, and we're going to add what I think is one of the most constructive approaches that we can take to writing Shiny code. Do things once. So Shiny is a complex environment, and the more efficient we can be, both in our basic R code and in the way we structure our apps, the, the smoother things will go, the faster our apps will run, the happier our clients will be, and the better use we'll make of our limited hosting time. You do notice, though, that there's an asterisk here, and that's because sometimes we can't do things once because they have to happen in a reactive context. So if I could uh, revise what I said a moment ago, we will endeavor to do things once unless they happen to have, have unless they have to happen in a reactive context, in which case we will endeavor to do everything else once so that we can reserve as much of our memory as possible for those things that have to happen in a reactive way. So when we talk about making uh, efficient shiny code that's fun to work with, we are going to be sort of carrying forward the natural extension of the concepts that we talked about in the previous video where we're going to be working on code that's easy for humans to read and hopefully fun for humans to work with. And we're going to, because we're all either researchers or work with researchers, we're going to endeavor to make code that's reproducible. So it's both displaying a research product and telling readers how we got to that product. Um, this is a new one for us, but we wanna think about how to write code that's compartmentalized. So we're splitting our code units up into reasonable parts and we're thinking analytically about how the parts interact. And finally, we wanna focus as much as we can on making code that is automated and prepared for our Shiny app. So I'll get into that in more detail later, but this is very much all in the spirit of doing things once where we're going to try and prepare our app for our users as much as possible so that the actual app code does the minimal number of operations it needs to. So as in our previous video, we're going to mark our best practices with the smiley face and our less than best practices with the frowning face. The first thing I wanna talk about is readability, mostly for us as programmers. So as you've likely already noticed, shiny code can turn into kind of a thicket of punctuation sometimes where we end up with lots of parentheses from all of this nesting structure. And what I want to encourage you to do, especially when you're first starting out, is to uh, use indenting and use comments to bump that structure out over space, both vertical and horizontal space. So whenever you open a new parentheses for a layout or a sidebar, write yourself a nice little comment and say, open sidebar. And then when you close it again, lower down, write yourself a nice little comment and just say closed sidebar. And you don't even have to leave these in your finished product, but just putting in little sort of construction supports for yourself like this can make your app development process just way smoother and save you all the headache from trying to track down rogue parentheses. The next thing I wanna talk about is accessibility. And this is gonna form a bigger part of our shiny best practices discussion um, and we'll get more in depth in it in the next video where we look at app code, but I want to just sort of talk briefly about it, what it means for a product to be accessible. So when we're talking about shiny code being accessible, we're really going to think about how it presents itself for users who are visually impaired or blind and users who are hard of hearing or deaf. So one of the biggest things that you have to think about when you have somebody who's visually impaired or blind is that they're likely using some sort of assistive technology when they're accessing your app. And that means probably they're using something like a, a screen reader. And uh, there's lots of different screen readers out there, but the thing that they all have in common is that they'll read all the text on the screen to you. So if you want to have a sort of a quick simulation of what this looks like, if you, uh, if you have an iPhone, 
you can uh, press the home button and tell Siri to turn on voiceover. So I'll, I'll play this for you real quick. Turn on voiceover. voiceover on. Okay, so now I have voiceover on on my iPhone. And listen what happens when I start touching different apps on my phone. All right, so you hear that kind of voice. So the voice is telling you what's on the screen and it's telling you how to interact with it. And that's the sort of experience that, that visually impaired users are going to have with your app. So all this means is that when we're writing shiny code and we want to make it accessible to people who are blind and visually impaired, we have to think about giving that screen reader something to read. So that means that whenever we're putting in stylized text and equations, even though it's sometimes a little bit harder, we want to make sure that we're using actual text and actual math syntax rather than pictures of text or pictures of syntax. So even if you're ever tempted to do that, just because it's a little bit easier to work with, just remember that you going the extra step means that somebody else can appreciate all your hard work. The other thing is that whenever we're using uh, pictures and graphics, there's a few steps that we can take to make sure that uh, they have what's called alt text or alternative text that will describe the image or explain what's happening in a figure for users who are interpreting it in an audio interface. And I'll show you guys how to implement all that in a little bit. But just so you know, that's really a big motivator for, uh, for designing accessible interfaces. And if you spend just a little bit of time thinking about this, you can also save yourself a lot of time down the road when you are uh, in situations where you have to design ADA compliant figures or outputs. The next thing I wanna talk about is um, any case where we're using sound in a Shiny app. And this is kind of the complement of thinking about, um, thinking about designing apps where a screen reader can, can use them. So whenever we're using sound, be it in a video or just somewhere where we're, um, you know, including a sound, maybe we want to have some bird calls or frog calls or something uh, to, to, um, to sort of set the environment for users. If we want to think about users who are deaf and hard of hearing, we want to make sure that they don't miss out on that experience. So if you're using a sound, include just a caption that tells you what the sound is. Just have a description of the sound. Um, likewise, if you embed a video, make sure that you have captions on it. These kinds of things um, can be a bit of an investment for you on the front end. And they're a really great way for you to grow as a programmer because they encourage you to think analytically about the different elements in your app and about how things are fitting together and how the user is perceiving your app and your code. Now I wanna to touch briefly on reproducibility. And again, we'll go into this, but one of the one of the best ways that we can uh, smooth our apps entry into the world is by preparing things ahead of time as much as possible. And I am personally of the opinion that if we are uh, using data products that have been filtered, especially if there's somebody else's data, we should give app users a way to look at the data operations we did before the data came into the app. So obviously the user can look at the app code and everything, um, but I personally think that it's good practice to also present uh, the raw data and to appropriately attribute it and to include the code showing how you cleaned it up for your app. So the app that I'm going to show you later includes all of this. It has a, a bunch of BBS and eBird data and it includes the data processing file that I used to clean it all up for the app and it includes a readme that gives proper attribution and explains how the pieces fit together. So now I'm going to get a little bit technical. We're going to start talking about compartmentalization. So as you've likely already noticed, shiny code can get kind of big, kind of fast. So one of the best things we can do, both for our app function and for our ease of use as programmers, is to think about compartmentalizing the code. So 
a lot of the time, a series of small cascading functions is both more efficient and easier to work with than one big function. And the reason I say it's easier to work with is because if we have a series of smaller functions that cascade to perform an operation, that means that we can test and check and debug simpler sets of behaviors. Whereas if we have one big function and it breaks, it takes us a lot more time to trace down that error. So by building small functions, we can, we can design sort of that minimal viable product and then build on as opposed to designing a really large sort of complex Rube Goldberg um, sort of apparatus right from the get go that is really challenging to um, update and manage. So again, I'll show you more in practice what I mean by this, but just think when you're thinking about designing code, think about your big vision, but also think about how you can build it out of small blocks. The next technical aspect that I want to think about is automation and preparation. And again, we'll get into this in more detail in the code video, but the more that we can do ahead of time outside of the shiny context, the smoother our app will run and the less we have to stick in the actual app code, which will make it easier to read. So as much as we can, we want to process data files ahead of time so that we're really limiting any filtering or any data processing that happens in the app to those reactive actions that are happening as a consequence of user actions. Um, this also goes for, for things like custom functions where we can uh, include packages of custom functions to go with our apps and that we can source into the Shiny environment and use. And these two strategies together, I think are gonna come up quite a bit for, uh, for folks, especially with the tendency of this group to gravitate towards geospatial product projects. So the idea of using custom functions and pre-processing data is gonna be really important, for example, for like big rasters or big sets of spatial points. And we'll, we'll tackle those individual challenges as they arise but I just want you to be thinking about the strategy about prepping as much as possible outside the app and thinking about the way that you can limit the number of operations by writing yourself functions ahead of time to do them without having to duplicate code. If anyone is really into software engineering and wants to dig more into this, I would encourage you to check out the shiny modules approach. And shiny modules are kind of like meta functions. So if you think about like the UI as a function, a shiny module is a way to um, reuse shiny elements in the same way. So it's a way that we can scale our apps, keeping in mind this idea that we only want to define sets of actions once. And I'm not going to get super deep into it, uh, but there's a really great explanation in the Mastering Shiny book, and I would encourage you to check it out. The other thing that we can do is that we can actually write and package Shiny apps as R packages, um, which is sort of a similar idea. So that's also explained in depth in the Mastering Shiny book. And I would absolutely encourage you to check both those resources out. So once again, I drew a lot of uh, the information in this from my own reading, uh, particularly Mastering Shiny in this point, in this, uh, in this video. I've also really appreciated, once again, the uh, YouTube channels having uh, plenary talks, particularly from Winston Chang and Zhou Cheng, who are two of the main developers on Shiny. They both give fantastic talks, both on high-level topics and on uh, really sort of nuts and bolts technical issues. So thanks, everyone, for reading. And I'll see you in just a few minutes on my end for a code overview.